Literature Exchange, where I look after our issuer business there. Um, we've got a panel for half an hour this morning with Mines and Money's usual stellar lineup, looking at how COVID-19 has changed the mining investment and financing landscape and whether these changes are uh, temporary or long term. Um, We've got four panelists in alphabetical order. Andrew Ballingell, who's the Chief Investment Officer at Ballingell Capital Investment Advisors. Bert Koth, who's a partner at Denham Capital. Julian Traeger, the CEO of Anglo Pacific. And Martin Valdez, who's a managing partner looking after Latin America at Resource Capital Funds. So I'm going to launch straight into the questions. Um, there is a question uh, facility in the, in the technology. So if anyone listening has some questions, do send them through and we'll try and get those in later on. But the first question is um, really uh, for, for everybody, um, what has changed in the financing landscape for mining over the last few months since the virus arrived? Um, are these changes only related to the virus or are there other factors at work? Um, it seems particularly that the gold market has changed a lot. We just heard a very interesting presentation on on that, um, but I'd be interested also in views on other commodities, copper, um, e electric vehicle metals, and perhaps something we don't hear quite so much about, um, uranium. So um, I'm going to try and do this in uh, alphabetical order. So Andrew, uh, would you like to start? What, uh, what changes have you seen in what metals? Well, obviously, in short term, um, virus related supply disruptions for iron ore in Brazil in particular, and for copper in Chile. Um, and both of those are having an impact on prices at a time when demands are remaining relatively robust, particularly out of China. Um, I think the more durable change in terms of physical supply and one that is likely to have quite important medium term impacts on price is uranium. Uh, but undoubtedly, the commodities that have received the biggest fillip from uh, the virus indirectly via massive stimulus we've seen, both fiscal and monetary, uh, from governments all around the world, um, has completely transformed the monetary and fiscal backdrop of our precious metals, and most obviously gold. Mm. Um, Bert, would you like to, to build on that? Yeah, I mean, rather than comment on individual metals, I would rather um, comment on how, how the COVID-19 situation has actually um, impacted our investment behavior overall, because what I'm going to say is basically applicable to, the, to all metals and minerals. Um, number one is um, when we invest, it's usually very large tickets, so we got to be able to carry out technical due diligence. And I see at the moment um, the ability of an investment fund to carry out proper technical due diligence um, quite compromised um, because of all the travel restrictions, right? So for example, when you fly out of Australia, when you come back, you got two weeks in quarantine each time when you come back to Australia. In other countries, you're two weeks in quarantine on the way in. So we had a technical guy on our team who spent six weeks in quarantine just to, to do a, a three-day site visit. Um, so that you can, you do that as a maximum, maximum like once a year, right? Uh, now, that's probably just a temporary thing, but that definitely is an obstacle um, to mobilize the deployment of capital. In some countries like Australia, Canada, there is a critical mass of local um, technical um, consulting and engineering talent that can mobilize for due diligence. But in quite a number of other countries, that would be quite complicated. Now, um, the second, um, I would say the second main impact is um, at the moment, the world takes it basically for granted that eventually we'll have a vaccine and there's a V-shaped recovery of sorts. So that seems to be the kind of the implicit and embedded assumption that everybody makes. But that's not a given, right? You only have a vaccine once you have a vaccine. So I guess let, when you, let's say you've got a project that's only got 10, 12 years life of mine, you know, as a prudent investor, you maybe have to assume that the first four or five years life of mine are still going to be compromised by demand destruction, very low metal prices, right? And, and then the question is maybe if it's, if it's a 10, 12 year life of mine project, maybe there's only five or six years left and but the project really makes money. Is that worth investing? Question mark, right? Um, so we certainly, we certainly also kind of look at projects now what is the real life of mine, the like life of mine? Because if it's relatively short, 
it does not give enough optionality for a real prolonged downrun in prices. I would say this is kind of the two main concerns that we have about the current situation. Interesting. Interesting to hear the, 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 the real practical impact of this on, on people doing business like you. Um, Julian, over to you. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, I mean, we're not really gold specialists, but I think the trends that we saw before the virus, we will see uh, accelerated, become more prominent. So one is lack of finance. And I think af after this, in the coming months, there's going to be rolling bankruptcies, particularly in real estate, which are severely going to affect the ability of banks to lend money. And so you'll see a further full pullback uh, from general lending and also to the uh, mining sector. I think coming out of this, there will also be increased interest and emphasis on air quality, health, um, and so carbon footprints, ESG issues are going to become more prominent rather than less. And then finally, and this we saw beginning uh, before the COVID crisis, but particularly the sort of global distrust of China will lead to the development of these national supply chains, which are paradoxically good for the mining sector in that um, they are less efficient and so there'll be more demand for raw materials. Um, but uh, there'll be countries who will have to decide who they're going to be supplying, whether it's going to be the East or the, or the West. And obviously for bulk materials, um, we will see more of these new, new deals uh, in the US, the UK and other countries where governments move from paying people not to work to paying people to work, whilst the private sector um, isn't able to pick up the slack. So there's some very interesting macro trends which are going to come out of this. Yeah, and I definitely want to come back to the China thing um, later on in our session. But um, while we're, we're just on this sort of opening question, Martin, you're in, uh, you're responsible for uh, Latin America, and right now that seems to be the 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 hot the hottest part of the of the world if, as far as COVID is concerned. Yeah, Graham, exactly. I'm based in Chile, so early morning for me. Um, uh, I, I would say, obviously, I mean that's my fellow panelists have said, we're seeing a lot of volatility in the market. Uh, if you take a look to the copper market, for instance, and I know Andrew mentioned Chile, I mean, two, three weeks ago, actually, when you were reading the news, Codelco and, and the government was saying that the copper output was, going on, was not going to be significantly impacted with the current situation. But in the last three weeks, that speech has changed uh, drastically. Mm -hmm. and, and according uh, to some new projections, actually, they're seeing uh, a shortage in production, therefore coming into an oversupply in the market. So I think we will see a lot of market volatility coming in the, in, I would say, in the next six months in, in each of the commodities. Um, in terms of how this is impacting us, uh, I think very similar to what Bert was saying. I mean, for us, we are long-term investors and we put significant tickets. So that sort of short-term market volatility is very difficult to predict. So we're trying to see what is really happening to supply and demand in the in the medium to long term, and how that is affecting uh, sort of our our um, curve prices. Um, and 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 I and I think it's a very good point, the one that he mentions also trying to focus in longer life of mind type of uh, assets, which at the end can give you. Um, a better way of uh, passing sort of the short-term volatility. Uh, one thing that we are struggling as well is um, uh, due diligence. I mean, obviously, in the new opportunities that we're seeing for us, it's quite critical to perform side visits, and we believe that we learn a lot from those side visits. So that's something that we're trying to see how we manage. Uh, obviously, we're, I mean, companies are offering virtual side visits and all of that, but being sort of on the ground gives you also the possibility to talk to the people, try to see with your own eyes, I mean, what is really happening in the environment, in the towns nearby, all of that. So I think that's something that we still have not actually come, put our minds together in terms of how that can be solved. Uh, I know my colleagues in Australia, for instance, they, they are free to travel within their uh, provinces, uh, but 
uh, at least here in Latin America, probably the travel restrictions actually will continue for quite some time. So that's mm -hmm. probably for us uh, one important thing that has changed with the COVID situation. And, uh, and definitely I completely agree with what Julian said and, and we're putting a lot of focus at, uh, on, that, on ESG as well. I mean, how the market is going to change uh, coming into sort of in the next years regarding ESG issues. Hmm. Hmm. I, I, moving on a little bit, I, I, I was wondering, has, I guess there's the impact of the virus and then there's other things that are happening in the world. Are people looking at um, political risk, jurisdictional risk differently in this post, uh, or <laughs> I'm saying post virus, in the world where we're, where we're with the virus, the current virus world? Um, again, I'll try and keep it in alphabetical order. And Andrew, jurisdictional risk, or is it simply about the practical difficulties of, of getting somewhere and getting back again? Definitely not. And and there are, I think, two um, changes. Firstly, as pressures rise on everybody, but particularly uh, emerging market economies, uh, some of which are very dependent on commodity prices, including oil, um, we will inevitably see rising tensions and efforts to uh, claim more of the pie from commodity producers, um, which can come via renegotiations of tax agreements, um, higher royalties or levies, and, and in some cases just outright confiscation. So just in terms of conventional investing, uh, definitely a rise in, in jurisdictional risk. Um, but more important, I think, and it, it's one that works to the definite advantage of the precious metal spectrum in particular, is that the virus has unleashed a whole lot of problems that were waiting uh, to be uh, unleashed. And they are primarily in the economic and financial arena. But behind them lies some very profound social and political tensions within countries and geopolitical tensions between countries. And it's always been our forecast, which has been quite a long running forecast, that when the next bad time arrives, when the next recession, a major bear market turns up, it will have obviously very significant, and I mean really significant economic and financial implications, but the more significant implications will be social and political and potentially geopolitical. Um, to put it most simply, the risk has gone from being very perceived to be very low to now being rather better appreciated, but by our estimation is still dramatically underestimated relative to where it will end up. And our, our model for the gold price has always had three components in it. Firstly, the cost of producing gold, uh, which actually ironically has probably come down because of the fall in the oil price and some of the currencies, uh, but is on an economic basis to get a return probably still of the order of twelve to thirteen hundred dollars uh, on an all-in basis. Uh, and gold is trading above that, but it's traded at multiples of cost in the past, and it's trading at a premium, but not a huge premium. Second is is the returns on alternative assets. Uh, competing assets, most obviously interest rates. And we've just been told that there are going to be no interest rates. Interest rates have been abolished now for the foreseeable. We have something like 20 trillion of debt worldwide with no interest on it. Um, um, equities have been remarkably resilient and by our estimation are expensive and very expensive relative to prospective earnings, cash flows and credit worthiness. And real estate similarly challenged, uh, as Julian has pointed out, both commercial and um, uh, industrial retail real estate is, is going to see major declines in, in rents and changes in cap rates up. So I think the prospective returns on competing assets now look very poor. The third component is completely unquantifiable and explains why we get these extraordinary surges in um, precious metals periodically, which is perceptions of risk. And that can be risk in terms of credit risk. Um, but I think the biggest drivers are... are political, social, 
geopolitical physical risk and and mm. we've lived through a very benign period of that globally and i think that's going to change dramatically in the next two three four years which is why i don't forecast the gold price other than that it's going to be a lot higher and we've said that since it was 11 12 13 14 1500 mm. and here we are at almost 1800 and i would still say mm. that it has a very very long way to go that we're in the early stages of this bull market in in gold and i believe mm. also in silver um in, and in the beginning foothills of the bull market in precious metals equities. Interesting. Um, moving on, uh, um, Bert, I'd be interested to hear your views on, on jurisdictional risk assessment. You gave it a very vivid picture of how hard, how hard it is to um, visit some of these assets uh, in, in practical terms. Is beyond the, 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 the physical problems, the, the practical problems, what's your view on, on any changes in, in uh, jurisdictional risk uh, assessment? Well, for us as a mining private equity firm, the single biggest jurisdictional risk that's out there is the increasing political and economic bifurcation between East and West. Um, primarily uh, with kind of talks about a potential Cold War between the US and China, um, because any such development must have most material ramifications for the metals mining complex, like. China consumes roughly 50% of all metals and minerals uh, produced on this planet. Um, so, so we as a, as a private equity firm, we are very exit motivated. So basically we assume the execution risk to build those mines with a few to ultimately sell them to the highest bidder. So again, I'm not saying any of this will happen, but the question poses itself, could there be a world where Western private equity firms are not allowed to sell businesses to China? for example, um, five, five, five to eight years down the road, um, just because the metals and minerals are being considered strategic all of a sudden, and then private equity firms have find it much more difficult to exit the assets. Or could there be a scenario where uh, Western-owned, Western private equity-owned mining company in a particular country is not allowed to sell its off -take? to China? Or so. so so again, I mean, ho hopefully none of that is ever going to happen. But um, there is for sure all of a sudden uh, a geopolitical black swan somewhere sitting in the background uh, where such ideas or concerns that one could have dismissed as outright nonsense only five years ago uh, may be no longer sounding so nonsensical. Um, mm. So that would, be, um, that would be one of my main concerns. Um, that we're really sliding in a period of a, some kind of Cold War-like construct that actually has real impact on the financial and commercial world. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, something that seems to be coming up. On, I hope it's not going to happen. I absolutely <laughs> hope it's not going to happen. What I'm saying is, it's it does not appear to be an impossibility sure. from how the world looks yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, something that's come up a couple of times is is this the the, the changing, developing relationship between let's call it east and west. I mean, one of the things that we've seen quite a lot of in the last few months and um, before I go on to Julian just want to mention is is Chinese acquisitions of mines um, particularly amongst the you know some of the TSX listed companies there was TMAC a small one bought by um, Shandong but before that it was Continental Gold bought by Zijin there's been a couple of um, Shandong's got a bid out I think for cardinal resources um, at the moment um, I don't know whether this is China getting their um, you know positioning themselves ahead of uh, uh, perhaps a, a more difficult relationship um, in the future. But Julian, do you have a, a view on that? And Martin as well, because a lot of the activity is in, um, is in Latin America. Well, I think the Chinese, you know, have got their act together and are in less disarray than of the West. So I think there is a window of opportunity for them to take advantage of, um, you know, dislocations that are occurring. But I would agree with Bert that, you know, the West and the rest is definitely going to be a theme. I think we are going to be seeing in the coming months already the Western government starting to play more obviously in the metals space. And I think in the next couple of months, we'll see the first US backed equity story in, in mining uh, from the US government. So I think that will be a new trend. Uh, but Going back to my earlier comments about the acceleration of pre-COVID trends, 
uh, I think um, the developing world will find it more and more difficult. Um, I think ESG trends, unfortunately, have encouraged us all to get less exposure in countries which may need more improvement. Um, and um, the financial implications of the COVID crisis for developing countries like South Africa, for instance, um, are quite dire and it's unclear um, how they're going to be able to afford these. So you are going to have, I think, much more difficult environments in the developing world. And then in the developed world, um, there's going to be this, this macro clash uh, with governments increasingly intervening in the mining space. Mm, interesting. Martin, you must have seen, I mean, we, we clearly are seeing um, uh, quite a lot going on from China in with Latin American assets. Does it have a specific resonance for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, I mean, as, as Julian uh, said, I mean, I think China has been putting their act together and it's not related to specifically to COVID situation. I think China has been an active um, player in the mining market and in the m and market, uh, M&A mining market actually for quite some time. I mean, Continental was, I believe, 2019. Uh, and they're also looking for good assets. I mean, good assets. I mean, uh, Continental, Guyana Goldfield, uh, and Timac, the, the names that you mentioned, all of them are quite um, good assets. I mean, Continental at the end, they ended up paying pretty much over four times of what it was trading before this uh, bidding war started. And, and they put a significant premium to the other um, to, to the other offer. Um, so I think, I mean, it's something that they have been doing for quite some time, obviously, uh, with the current situation. Um, in the case of Guyana Goldfields, it was not specifically to COVID related issues. I mean, the, the situation that they were in. And TMAC also is not a related to COVID situation. TMAC is a matter of, uh, uh, it's another problem at the end. Um, so I think in general, I mean, they have been been an active player for quite some time. I think uh, they have taken sort of the opportunities that they're out there and, and they're looking for good assets. And again, we see them quite actively in the region, in Brazil, in general, in Chile, actually, they, they're quite active as well. So I think it's not related to COVID. I think it's related to, I mean, it's a plan that it has been going on for quite some time. Yeah, interesting, interesting. We have had um, a few questions from um, the audience. Um, uh, we've only got about five minutes left, um, but there's something that I've wanted to touch on before we, uh, we, we, may, we may not have time for the audience questions, but something I did want to um, ask the panel about because I see it as um, an interesting, and in this rather negative uh, or, 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 or uh, more risky world, perhaps something a little, a little more positive to talk about, there seems to been a growth over the past, um, I would say over the past six or nine months in um, sort of nil cost, nil, nil premium mergers. Um, so the, the, I guess the biggest one was in Deva and Semifo. Um We had Argonaut and um, Alio SSR, something with Alistair Gold. And I'm wondering whether what we're seeing is, um, I guess what I really mean is I'm, I hope what we're seeing is a trend where the smaller independent um, Late, de late stage development or smaller producers are merging to create a new class of, of larger independents, which it seems to me in the public markets, there is a bit of a lack of, uh, of larger, uh, more investable independent um, mining producers. And, and I would hope that if that is the case, we'll start to see um, uh, the, the, the general funds Rather than the specialist investment funds like like uh, like we have here today, uh, getting back into the market, and I wonder if you do think um, that is a trend that's a real, b going to continue, and, and c uh, will it actually have the effect of getting the the more general fund managers, generalist fund managers, back in the market? Um, I think we've got about three minutes left, so um, Andrew, if I can ask you to say. Yeah, I mean, it brings together two things. One is is the dearth of investable market capitalization in gold mining equities with the top 10 companies accounting for the vast bulk of what is only $500 billion of equity market cap. I mean, well, that would fit in Jeff Bezos' left pocket. It's absolutely tiny and the ETF's only a couple hundred billion. 
We're still left, even when these companies merge, and we've been involved in five, six of these in the last six months, very happily, um, quite often on both mm -hmm. sides. You're still only creating companies with four or five billion dollar market caps, um, albeit with a million ounces of production in quite a lot of cases. They are moving from definitely niche investments to investments that bigger fund managers can invest in, but they're not solving the problem of the dearth of high quality investable market cap in the precious metals area. Um, they do represent uh, uh, improvement in logic and structure. Uh, interesting, a lot of these companies were very well managed before they merged. Uh, our big complaint about the big end of town for a lot of the last 15, 20 years is there have been terrible stewards of capital. Interestingly, virtually all the senior management of the major mining company, gold mining companies has changed. Yeah. And they are now extremely well managed for the most part. So the, the resistance of the generalists uh, has been around two things, really. One, there have been poor investments because they've been poorly managed and partly because of poor commodity prices. But most importantly, because they're just irrelevant. You know, this is less than 1% uh, of global market capitalization, equity market capitalization. Yes. Yeah. The, the allocation will come when they've gone up. You know, people always make their decisions in the rear view mirror. And I think the gold mining sector will have doubled or more before most of the generalists get back into it. Yeah, um, we've got uh, two minutes left. So, Bert, if I could have a, a, a final word from you before we move on to the other two. Yeah, it's just, just super fast. I don't want to comment on the generalist investors, just mergers. Mergers as so-called egos. Usually the, the, the ego of the CEO stands in the way. Um, so unless companies are usually really desperate or so, um, that there's not too many mergers happening. But um, what, what Andrew first said regarding really um, good high quality investment opportunities, we actually um, see a gradual decline of the channel quality of investment opportunities out there. And part of the reason is because just after years of uh, entrepreneurial risk capital starvation in the sector, just the pipeline isn't get filled up with earlier stage mm -hmm. de-risking and exploration. So actually, um, I, I think we see the first signs that actually just asset quality is going down because there's nothing coming up to actually replenish the pipeline. Yeah, so not all, all positive. Um, Julian, we've got a I think uh, to agree with Andrew, I mean, liquidity and scale create value. Um, yeah. And you don't have to get a premium in the initial transaction to believe that you're going to get a premium from the market when you're bigger. Yeah. Very, very nicely put. And Martin, if I could have yeah, no, I'm, I'm your last you. comment with a minute left. Yeah, I'm with Julian, Andrew, and Bert at the end. Uh, I mean, the zero premium, everything at the end, at the end is relative as well. So, um, yeah. but I agree that that actually what you're looking is synergies and, and, and create volume. But perhaps a step in the right direction, at least. And it would be you know, nice to end, I hope, on a, on a fairly positive um no. Thank you, everybody. I'm getting the finger waved at me. So um, uh, as far as the audience is concerned, I think you know how to reach us. Do send us your questions, congratulations or criticisms. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.